In this lesson, we're going to put the pieces together of everything that we've done so far to show that logic and theories of arithmetic are undecidable. One step that we need to take to do this is to show how that we can convert facts about numbers to facts about formulas. And to do this, we'll use the idea of a Gödel numbering. This is something which is due to the logician Kurt Gödel. Uh, Gödel numbering is a way of assigning natural numbers to expressions in the language of arithmetic so that these three criteria are satisfied. Different Gödel numbers are assigned to different expressions. The Gödel number of a given expression can be calculated and it's effectively decidable or recursive uh, to decide whether a Gödel number is a Gödel number of an expression and if so, what expression it happens to be the Gödel number of. Now, lots of textbooks go through defining a particular Gödel numbering in detail. I don't care about any of those details because basically we've invented a canonical Gödel numbering now, which is uh, the thing called Unicode, which is the way that formula, the way that any kind of text of any kind is represented inside computers and computer networks. And uh, Unicode expression, you just type your formula in, whatever your favorite word processing text editor thing is, and just save it and see the internal representation in the computer of what that expression was. And that's just a number. It's just a string of ones and zeros, which is a binary representation of a number. And that representation satisfies all of the criteria of being a Gödel numbering. So that'll do for defining a Gödel numbering. The important thing for us is that the Gödel, given any Gödel numbering, the Gödel number for a formula is a number. And so in the language of arithmetic, we've got a name for that number, the numeral for that number. So that means for any formula in our language, call one A, there is a number in the language which kind of represents A. It's the code for A. So we'll represent that not by writing out a big long number, but just by writing the A with these funny looking uh, corner quotes. They're like a different kind of quotation mark, which has become standard for the internal representation in the language of arithmetic for the formula A. Now, you might think, well, the language has already got a representation of the formula A. It's the formula A itself. That's something that's in the language. But that is something that is in the language as a formula, as a sentence, as the kind of thing which is true or false. Whereas uh, quotes A, the internal representation, the name of A, is not itself a formula. It's a name. It's a particular numeral. Because A is a formula, it makes sense to say, if A then B, that's another formula. But if quotes A then B makes no more sense than if 5 then B. Those things aren't even sentences. They don't make sense. What we can say using Gödel numbers is quotes A equals quotes B. That's to say that A and B are the same sentence. Or we could even say something like quotes A is even, because quotes A, remember, names a number, and whether that number is even or odd is something we can ask. So remember, quotes A is a numerical term. It, all it is is a zero followed by a large number of primes. Exactly how many depends on the formula A itself. Now remember, we've used the technique of diagonalization twice. Once when we were looking at Cantor's theorem, showing that bit streams can't be enumerated. And next, when we were looking at the halting problem, and we showed that the halting function cannot be encoded by any register machine. In each of these cases, we did something where we applied a number in two different ways. We looked at the number for example, of a bit stream in an enumeration, and then we looked at the value of the bit stream that number of positions are long.
And that was what makes it diagonal. We did the same thing for a register machine. In the halting problem, we looked at the code of the register machine, and then we saw we asked the question whether that register machine halts on that very input. We're going to do exactly the same thing here, except now we're going to look at a formula and we're going to see the formula, the connection between that formula and its girdle number. Now, formulas don't have holes to plug things in unless they do, unless they've got free variables. So here, given a formula with a free variable x, so we pick out a particular free variable, we'll use x. The diagonalization of that formula is going to be this particular formula here. There is an x such that x equals quote say and a. Now when a has the variable x free in it, this is like the formula a holds of quote say. In fact, it's a very easy deduction in logic to go from this formula to the diagonalization formula and back. Because if A holds of quotes A, that, which after all, quotes A is just some number, then there is something which is identical to that number such that A holds of it. And on the other hand, if there is something which is identical to that number, there and a holds of it, then it must hold of quotes a because that's the only thing that uh, is identical to quotes a. So that's just elementary logic uh, to go in both directions there. So you can get this kind of diagonalization picture where you think of the formulas listed one by one and you can think of them being applied to various things and the diagonal in this picture is applying this formula to its own girdle number. So that might give you a hint of why this is called diagonalization. Let's have a look at how it works in concrete practice given a particular little formula. What I've got here is the formula x plus 0 equals 0. And its diagonalization is there is an x such that x equals n and x plus 0 equals 0, where n is whatever the girdle number is of x plus 0 equals 0. So it's just some longer formula, and you can see that that is going to be logically equivalent to saying that n plus 0 is 0. Now there's a bunch of new concepts here, and some of them refer to things in the language, and some of them refer to the things the language talks about, namely numbers. And it's important to get these straight in your head. So here's a diagram that might help. Remember, we've got the numerals, the things in our language, like zero with an underline and you know, zero with primes behind them and things like that, which refer to particular numbers. Then there are the formulas in the language, things like two plus two is four, and all of the other kinds of formulas that we can make with our quantifiers and connectives and everything. These are the kinds of things which are true or false in our models, which follow from the axioms or don't follow from the axioms and those sorts of things. These things are represented in our language or encoded by girdle numbers, which are numbers. And since these are numbers, there are going to be numerals in the language which stand for them. Finally, we use the connection between A and quotes A to define the notion of the diagonalization of a formula. Now, since the diagonalization is itself a formula, it has a girdle number too. And so this relationship of diagonalization on the language side is paired up with a relationship on the numbers side. For any number, if that's the girdle number of a formula, we can find another number, which is the girdle number of the diagonal of that formula. And that's a function from numbers to numbers. At least for numbers which are girdle numbers of formulas, we could define the girdle number of the diagonal of that formula and calculate that in terms of this original number. That relationship is what we call the diagonal function. Given any number, n, diag of n is the girdle number of the diagonalization of the formula with girdle number n, if there is such a number, and for the things which aren't uh, girdle numbers of formulas, we just say that diag of those numbers is zero. 
That's a function from numbers to numbers. It's very easy to define. So if n is the Gödel number of x plus 0 equals 0, for example, then diag of n is the Gödel number of this, this formula. There is an x such that x equals n and x plus 0 equals 0. Diag turns out to be very easy to calculate. Here's how you do it. You check if n is the Gödel number of a formula. If it isn't, return 0. And if it is, you just add uh, code num the, the numbers in code for there is an x such that x equals n and in the front of the block, and then add the code for a right bracket at the back. This is a recursive function. And since it's a recursive function, it can be represented in Q by some formula. So if we return to this diagram, which shows what's on the language side of things and what's on the numbers side of things, the IAG function, which is represented here by this bright green arrow, which takes us from a number to a number, there's going to be an analog of it over here on the language side. So what we've got here is quite a complicated picture with the language on the left in red and numbers on the right in green. Now actually on the right we've got two things. We've got numbers in dark green and then we've got functions over there in bright green. And then over there on the left hand side of the, the diagram in the language half in red, up in the top we've got terms. These are the kinds of things that name numbers. While in the bottom we have formulas. These are the kinds of things which are true or false. Now, the things on the left are different kinds of things than the things on the right. They're both, you know, abstract things, but sentences and terms in our language are different things than numbers and functions on numbers. The last thing to note is that there's different sorts of links between these two worlds. The simplest is the reference or standing for relation, where a name like 0 or 5 stands for the number 0 or 5, or the name 2 times 5 plus 4, that complex numerical term, names 14. That's one relation between terms and numbers. Another relation is the relation between sentences and numbers, and that's the Gödel number of, or the encoding relation. You know, the Gödel number of the formula 2 plus 2 is 4, whatever big long number that is, that encodes the sentence that 2 plus 2 is 4 and encodes other sentences. This is mostly a relationship between numbers and sentences. That's what we're interested in. Although there's another encoding relation between numbers and terms too, because, you know, there's a Gödel number for each of these other terms as well. Then there is the, this representation relation between a sentence and a function that it represents. And we could also have the defining relation between formulas and sets of numbers that are defined by those formulas. We haven't put that in the diagram. There's not so much room for that. The other thing that's in this uh, diagram is the diagonalization uh, relation the diagonalization function, which takes us from a sentence to another sentence. So it's important to keep the differences here in mind so that you can see what different kinds of things are being defined. So in particular, let's go on with this formula that represents the diag function, because we can do a lot with that. In particular, we can prove this following fact. It's called a lemma. The diagonalization lemma goes like this. If I've got a theory like Robinson's arithmetic or piano arithmetic in which the diag function is represented, then for any formula B with a free variable Y, there is some sentence G such that the theory proves that G and B of quotes G are equivalent to each other. Now, this is a, an incredibly powerful fact that we're going to do a lot with. But before we do things with it, let's explain why it's actually true. We'll start off with this formula that represents the diag function in the theory T. What this means is if diag of the number n is the number k, then T can prove this. For every y, a of n y, if and only if y equals k. So this formula here with two free variables. The first variable represents the input of the diag function, n, here. 
and the second variable y represents the output. So we're going to uh, be working with this formula B, which has got the variable Y free in it, and we're going to use that to define what this formula G is going to be. We start off with this particular formula, which we're going to call F. It's the formula, there's a Y such that A of X and Y and B, Y. We'll pause for a moment and think about what this formula F says. It says there is some y which is the diagonalization of x and b holds of it. So this has got the variable y free and it basically says b holds of the diagonalization of x. So let n be the girdle number of that formula and then let g indeed be the diagonalization of this formula f. So in other words, g is this formula, there is an x such that x equals n and f holds, where n is the girdle number of f. The first thing to note is that logic proves that g is equivalent to there is a y such that a of n and y and b y. Here's why. g is this formula, there is an x such that x equals n and f, and that's equivalent to just plugging in n for x here. So I get this formula, there is a y such that a x y and b y, and I just plug in the n for the x there. It's there is a y such that a n y and b y. So logic tells us that. Now, T proves that for every y, a n y, if and only if y equals k, that's what it is for this formula to, uh, for the formula A to represent the diag function, where k is the girdle number of the formula G. So that's exactly what we need. Uh, if k is the girdle number of G, we've got this. So a n y is going to be equivalent to y equals k. So I can plug y equals k in here and get the t proves that g is equivalent to there is a y which is identical to k and b y. But that reduces to g is equivalent to b of k. Now what is k? It is the girdle number of g. It's the girdle number of g. So t indeed proves that g is equivalent to b of g. So that's the diagonalization lemma proved. Now we're going to step back and think about it for a bit, because frankly, that's incredible. It's amazing. It's a very, very powerful result. It tells us that any predicate in the theory, uh, like B with a variable free in it, is, has a kind of fixed point. That is, there's a sentence which is true if and only if that predicate holds of its girdle number. You might have heard when people talk about things like the liar paradox, uh, strange sentences which say things like, this very sentence is false. Now, this is probably a paradoxical sentence because if it's true, it's false. If it's false, it's true. Now, this doesn't really have a lot to do with arithmetic as it stands because arithmetic doesn't have a predicate false. We don't have a way in the language of arithmetic to describe a sentence as true or to describe a sentence as false. But more importantly, arithmetic doesn't have a pronoun like this. There's no way of getting a sentence to describe itself. Uh, every sentence has got a girdle number, and we've got a term for that girdle number, but that term for the girdle number of a sentence is always going to be longer than the sentence itself, so the sentence can't contain its own girdle number. But diagonalization allows us to get very close to this. So don't think of the predicate is true or is false. Just imagine we have some property that a sentence might have, like B, with the variable Y indicating what it's describing. So B of 1 means that the object 1 has got property B, and B of 5 says the object 5 does, etc. Well, the diagonalization lemma says that there is some sentence G which, according to the theory of arithmetic that we're using, G is equivalent to B of quotes G. That means that what the sentence G says is true if and only if the sentence G has got property B. 
That means you can think of the sentence as making the claim that that very sentence has property B. And that is something that we can do a lot with. So we're going to start rolling out the consequences of the diagonalization lemma from definability to what we can define in our languages to the fact that these theories are going to be undecidable. Now, remember, we said that a set of numbers is definable by a formula B in the theory T, if and only if the theory proves B of N just when the form number N is in the set, and it proves not B of N if and only if the number is not in the set. So, here's our first consequence. If I've got a theory, and it's consistent, so it can't be inconsistent, and it's at least as strong as Q, then the set of things that the theory can prove, the theorems of T, namely the Gödel numbers of those theorems, is not definable in the theory T itself. Here's why. Suppose we did have some formula which defines the set of Gödel numbers of theorems of that theory. Well, the diagonalization lemma tells us that there is a formula G which is equivalent to not C of G. So here, we're applying diagonalization on the predicate not C. And that's exactly the same kind of thing we do with diagonalization before when we were flipping the bits in bit streams. We were changing 1 to 0, 0 to 1. We're doing exactly the same thing here. We are inserting this negation, which is doing all the work. We can ask ourselves the question for this formula G. Uh, does the theory prove it or not? Well, if the theory proves it, then according to this equivalence, T's got to prove not C of G. And then since C defines the theorems of T, that means T can't prove G, because C of G is meant to represent the idea that G is indeed a theorem. So T can't prove G because this is a consistent theory. But if T doesn't prove G, then T doesn't prove not C of G because the theory is consistent, and since C defines all the theorems of T, T indeed proves G. Now, this is, of course, a contradiction. We've proved that if T proves G, it doesn't, and if T doesn't prove G, it does. So uh, we've got an inconsistency here, which means that there is no such predicate C, which defines the set of all theorems. The set of all theorems of this theory cannot be defined inside the theory itself. But remember, the recursive functions are the things which are representable in the theory, and the recursive sets are the things which are definable. So in this theory, the set of all theorems is not definable. So it immediately follows from that that if I've got a consistent theory, at least as strong as Q, the set of theorems of that theory is not recursive. That is, being a theorem of T is not decidable. We've shown that Robinson's arithmetic and any stronger consistent theory like piano arithmetic is undecidable. There is no algorithm for determining whether or not something is a theorem of the theory. We thought that was probably going to be the case because arithmetic is kind of complicated. Uh, but now we know our inability to find an algorithm for proving uh, exactly the theorems of arithmetic and refuting exactly the non-theorems, uh, we now know that we're never going to find such an algorithm. Any function which does that is not recursive. So this is a really powerful limitative result. It's our first undecidability result concerning a logical theory. An immediate consequence of this is that any consistent deductively defined extension of Robinson's arithmetic has to be incomplete too. Here's why. If I had a consistent deductively defined extension of Robinson's arithmetic, uh, call it T, since it's an extension of Q, it doesn't represent its own set of theorems, so, uh, but since it's an extension of Q, it does represent all the recursive sets, so the set of theorems of T is not recursive, we know that. But if T were complete, since it's deductively defined, it would be decidable, because its theorems would be a recursive set. Because remember, complete deductively defined theories, we put that algorithm. Uh, since its theorems are recursively enumerable, 
if it's consistent and complete, we could just check the theorems as they get generated, and wait for whether I or its negation is generated. And that would give us an algorithm to decide membership of the theory. So since this theory is undecidable, its theorems is not, its set of theorems is not recursive, that means it's also incomplete. Any axiomatic deductively defined extension of Q has got to have gaps in it. So this is our first hint or our first proof that piano arithmetic is also incomplete because it is deductively defined. It's just the little finite set of seven Robinson's arithmetic axioms plus all of the axioms of induction. But that's, it's recursively decidable whether or not a formula is an instance of induction. And so this is a deductively defined extension of Q2. So piano arithmetic's got to have gaps in it as well. We haven't filled in all the incompleteness by adding those induction axioms. So there we've shown that Q and a bunch of extensions of it are incomplete and undecidable. Now we're going to not go up from Q, we're going to go down to logic itself. The set of theorems of predicate logic is also undecidable. Suppose we had a way to decide if a formula is valid, is a tautology in the language of predicate logic. Then if we knew how to do that, we'd also be able to decide whether or not something was a theorem of Robinson's arithmetic. Because you just check if this sentence A, uh, if you want to check if this sentence A is a theorem of Robinson's arithmetic, you just check if logic alone proves this formula, Q1 and Q2 and Q3 and Q4 and Q5 and Q6 and Q7 implies A. That is a theorem of logic, it's tautology, if and only if A follows from the axioms of Robinson's arithmetic. But there's no way to decide recursively if something is a theorem of Q. So there's no way to decide if a formula is a tautology in the language of uh, predicate logic. So logic itself is undecidable as well. So we've got that Robinson's arithmetic and piano arithmetic and other consistent extensions which are deductively defined, are all undecidable and incomplete. We've got that logic is undecidable. Uh, it's also incomplete, but that was obvious, you know, P and not P. Uh, logic doesn't decide between those. Uh, what about going up even further? What about true arithmetic? That is a theory. It's consistent and it's complete. It's the set of all formulas that are true in the standard model of arithmetic. What can we learn about that? Well, since it's determined by a single model, it's complete. Since true arithmetic is complete, it can't be deductively defined. That's just modus tollens for the modus ponens that we've done before. Now, since true arithmetic is an extension of Q, it's not decidable. It doesn't represent its own theorems, and it does represent all recursive sets. This is what's called Tarski's indefinability theorem. This is the result which says that the truths of arithmetic cannot be defined by a recursive function. So let's sum up what we've proved so far. Any consistent extension of Q cannot define the set of its own theorems. That was the first thing that we proved using diagonalization. Now we also know that any consistent extension of Q can define all of the recursive sets, so we're going to put these two things together which says that any set of theorems of any consistent extension of Q cannot be recursive. So any complete and consistent deductively defined theory does have a recursive set of theorems. That's that algorithm I was telling you, just since it's recursively enumerable, if it's consistent and complete, that makes it recursive. So any consistent deductively defined extension of Q's got to be incomplete, putting three and four together. Now, if the set of theorems of predicate logic is recursive, so is Q. That's just a fact that Q is finitely axiomatized. So any uh, problem about whether or not something's in the theory of Q can be reduced to a problem of whether or not a particular formula is logically valid. It follows from that that predicate logic is undecidable. That's three and six together. Now, true arithmetic, the set of sentences true in the standard model, since it's a consistent extension of Q is not deductively defined, that is uh, a consequence of five. Then it follows from that that 
truth in the standard model of arithmetic is not recursive. And in fact, it's not even recursively enumerable. So that's a massive lot of consequences that we've all churned out. These are an amazing family of limitative results. We're going to extend this in our last lesson next week, where we're going to look at answering the specific questions. We know that Q and PI and these theories of arithmetic are incomplete. We know they've got to be incomplete. But just like uh, when we were looking at recursive functions, it's one thing to know that there are non-recursive functions. It's another thing to know some examples of them. Well, we already know why Q is incomplete. We've already seen that, for example, for every x for every y, x plus y equals y plus x can't be proved, and neither can its negation. But piano arithmetic isn't like that. Piano arithmetic can prove that addition is commutative. And in fact, piano arithmetic can prove a huge number of true arithmetic claims. It's an important issue. Where is it that piano arithmetic is incomplete? In fact, is there a way, and we'll see next week that there is a way, of for any theory like this, pinpointing what it is that it can't prove. And this will give us a, a greater insight into the kinds of limits of logical theories. But that's our topic for next week.